Greetings, this is Doc Ock coming at you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central here in Kent, Ohio. Yes, we have returned once again to continue telling the stories you love to hear and we love to tell. Another day, another story. We're about to engage in sharing some more of the glory with you of the story of Dr. Edward W. Crosby, the father of Black History Month. So if you don't know who he is, this is a good place to find out, and it's definitely the right time to find out. If you do know who he is, then you'll get to know a little bit more about the man and how he got to be the man that we all knew him to be. Meanwhile, let's go ahead and um, do the needful before I have to start getting pleadful. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about go ahead and subscribe to the Tubular Black Facts channel. Now, if you've already done that, great. We really appreciate that. If you have not already done that, now's the time to go ahead and do that. There are buttons below where you can, if you can find, hit that button. And it'll open up a, um, well, you know what? It'll automatically subscribe you. All it takes is just one touch and you'll be done. Right. You don't even have to double click. So why don't you go ahead and do that as we go ahead and move on into our story and begin our slideshow with a picture of the Crosby brothers the last of which passed away um, earlier this year. First my father, and then um, uh, my Uncle Fred. Okay, so they were the last of the original Crosbys, because Crosbys were not always Crosbys. There was a time when we, when our grandfather went by a different name. Now, what was that name? I wish I could tell you. Not quite sure. We have... Um, a few guesses, but we really don't know because he had to leave town at 13 years old up under a train. And he went from somewhere in the south all the way up to Chicago town. And that's where he began to create his new life. 13 years old. Imagine that, having to escape for your life at 13 years old. Because you know it was all about escaping for his life. There was quite a bit of strife going on. And sometimes the youth in those days had to run for their lives in order to survive. Now, before we move on, let's go ahead and um, do our um, word of the day, our saying of the day. Let's see what Dr. Crosby has to offer us today. Today's saying is, and this is what we, um, what we were attempting to put on his niche, because these were some of his last words. If you're going to do it, do it right. If you're going to do it, do it right. And he'd love to say that. And those words continue to ring in my head. And now I'm sharing it with you so they can continue to ring in your head as well. So uh, there you have it. Word of the day. If you're going to do it, do it right. Why would you do it any other way? Does, it just doesn't make sense. Oops. Wasn't supposed to do that. Uh-oh. Forgot I'd made the transition. Uh-oh. Well, a little bit premature there. Let you in my back room, it looks like there. But it's okay. You're back where you, you need to be, and I'm back where I need to be. Let's go ahead and continue on. We're in. We're still down in Tuskegee, Alabama. Pivotal time for Dr. Crosby as he um, actually is transitioning from Tuskegee back to Hiram College where he had his first uh, paid teaching assignment. So we're back up into Hiram and let's see what he has to say. I bring up Tuskegee's 104 year transformation from an institute to a university 
offering master and PhD or doctoral degrees to give evidence to its having earned a high tribute to black education in the United States of America. And I wish now that I had not given up on the Institute as quickly as I had. After returning to Hiram College for the 1963-1964 semester, I took another leave from Hiram in 1966 and volunteered at the fledgling Summit County Greater Akron Community Action Council in Akron, Ohio. Now that's a mouthful right there. When the Office of Economic Opportunity funded the Community Action Council later that year, I became one of its associate directors. But there was a problem with my hire. However, the council already had an associate, an associate director. Did it need two associate directors? Akron City Council, to whom uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity had conferred control over their War on Poverty program and its funds, didn't agree with my appointment initially. Their problem was my PhD, which happened not to be in an area of study related to the social issues the Community Action Council was supposedly established and funded to address. Since public education on all levels was my shtick or one of my professional areas of concern and expertise, I was passed along after some heated discussion in the city council. Still, I didn't fit easily into OEO's supposed quote-unquote war on poverty. As Akron's city council saw it, I quickly learned any constructive move to tackle what I considered to be the real causes of poverty in the black community were off limits. Imagine that. When a former Wall Street Journal investigative reporter joined Akron's Community Action Council, he wanted to write articles about Akron's housing problems, particularly those houses owned by slumlords. The reporter's first article was on a house fire in one of Akron's low-income communities. The house was owned by a slumlord and resulted in the death of one or more of its occupants. Immediately, the survivors and the community were aroused. The problem with his article was some council members may have had close associates who were landlords of slum properties or they might have also owned slum properties themselves. Huh. How about that? Sounds very similar to what was going on over here in Kent. They objected to the Community Action Council's having sponsored the article, complained to the city council president, who in turn registered a strong complaint with CAC's director, who had first argued for the CAC's reporter but later advised him to avoid all such articles in the future. From this incident, we most definitively learned OEO's funds and programs were controlled by Akron's political and business establishment, and any attempt to better black housing would bring loud outcries from the owners of these rental properties. The same was the case when public education became the issue. These outcries would be aired at city council meetings and the CAC's activities in each area would be scuttled. This reluctance to remove the barriers to warring against those endemic perpetrators, oh, excuse me, those endemic perpetuators of poverty caused me to seek out methods of, for relief from these barriers. The CAC had established community work areas in the four districts the city had already been divided into, East, West, North, and South Akron. The majority of Akron's black poor lived in East, West, and North Akron, 
a sizable portion of Akron's white poor lived in South Akron. The CAC director had placed in each district or community a community coordinator. Each of these individuals was allowed to assign four or five subordinate coordinators with little pay or on a voluntary basis. I can't now remember how these subordinates were paid. Fact is, whatever they were paid, it was certainly a pittance, but produced good results nevertheless. These community coordinators' workload consisted of roaming their districts, holding mass and sectional meetings, and handing, handling or actually solving small problems in the community in order to develop confidence in the CAC's operation and to seek out those social problems that existed according to those who lived in the area. Write the problems up, indicate which were solvable or needed the city's concerted attention. In their periodic reports, they gave as many details as possible and submitted them to the main office, which had been installed at 72 East Market Street in downtown Akron. In 1981, that building became part of the Akron Art Museum. East Akron's community coordinator was difficult to manage. He seemed always to have a chip on his shoulder, especially when it came to me. However, other coordinators also found him hard to manage as well. So before I resigned, I believe he had been summarily discharged from his post. On the west side, there was Mrs. There was Ms. Cassandra Gatlin. She was one of the community coordinators hired who quickly became a model poverty relief advocate. She and I worked very well together at times. However, her aggressive demeanor demanded that I not be viewed as one of her supporters for administrative reasons. Once she discovered an issue in West Akron, she would bring it to the CAC's executive director's attention and expect immediate action to address and remove the issue. When that didn't happen, as quickly as she wanted, she would take her complaint directly to the city council, which headed up the Community Action Council's board of directors. Sometimes when the council didn't address her issues with due alacrity, she would bring the issue to the attention of the OEO's regional office in Chicago. She soon became a nuisance to the city council, but also both an aid and a hindrance to the CAC's objectives. We tried to quiet her brazenness while we applauded her stick to which kept the city council on the defense to the point where they tried to offer her a job and a larger salary, thinking that once hired, the salary would cause her to settle down or be fired. Either way, Cassandra Gatlin refused to accept the bait. She wasn't stupid. It wasn't money she was looking for. She wasn't the hippest negotiator, but she was an advocate for the low-income residents of West Akron. She knew what the residents of her district were going through. She lived in West Akron and fought to have the problems in West Akron corrected. Now, not in the distant by and by. I brought up Cassandra Gatlin's work ethic and experiences on the job to illustrate the difficulties inherent in warring against poverty in America. Even when a government program has been created to prosecute the war, this was especially so in Akron because the CAC and those elements with whom it worked and its determined outliers like Ms. Cassandra Gatlin were up against a brick wall. And that wall was fortified by Akron's business and other interests which thrived on other city dwellers' poverty. A few years later, while I was directing the Institute for African American Affairs at Kent State, I ventured into a contract with Model Cities, another government-sponsored poverty program designed to fix up and clean up areas of depressed cities that con uh, contain poor people, black and white. 
I proposed an education program that would operate in two cities, Akron and Cleveland. The program I envisioned dealt with recruiting youth from poor communities, have them enroll in Kent State, and provide them with the economic supports necessary for their success. Like Akron's War on Poverty program, Cleveland's Model Cities program, which the late uncompromising community activist Fannie Lewis directed, was also controlled by its city council, particularly its city council president, George Forbes. Once I was granted the funding proposed, two individuals supposedly connected to Cleveland's Model Cities program approached me looking for their share of Model Cities funds that I had been granted. So he just fast forwarded there from his one of his earliest forays into um, community activism, working for the uh, Community Action Council. He just fast forwarded there to the uh, late 60s, early 70s, where he was now at, at Kent State. So now we're at, at Kent State, just to help you keep up with where we're at here. Uh, I had never experienced this kind of shakedown before. Initially, they asked for some money off the top of the funds awarded. I, of course, refused, using any and every reason I could muster. When their original ploy failed to get over, they constructed another one. Since I was connected to a university, they wanted me to give them a degree. Like I had those to hand out. Not a BA or an MA. They wanted me to give them a PH. You want I want to say it differently, but I'm going to refrain. A PhD. Without their having to work for it. Their request was ridiculous. So I fudged my response. My counter to their ploy was that I couldn't do that at Kent State because my institute didn't offer graduate degrees. However, I told them I believed I could arrange for them to earn a graduate degree at the University of Pittsburgh, where a good friend of mine was the provost. However, they would have to do two things. Call the provost office, set up an appointment with the appropriate office, and then drive over to Pittsburgh to be interviewed and learn what additional things they would have to do. Like submit their transcripts for all high school and colleges they had degrees from, their work experiences, three recommendations, etc. Those things normally requested to any enter any university's degree granting programs, regardless of level. They did all they were told to do, and they began to believe they had just gotten over until they were informed they'd have to pay tuition. <laughs> They were informed they had to pay tuition. Immediately, they showed up on my doorstep again. This time, they wanted me to pay their tuition. I told them I'd done all I could and would do. I had gotten both of them accepted into a graduate program at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, it was on them. Hello. They argued, but I stood firm. The next thing I heard was the telephone. It was a call from Cleveland's city council president, George Forbes, threatening to cancel the educational program Cleveland's model cities had already granted, which would also nullify the Akron model cities um, grant, which was in no way involved in this scam. I told the council president to do his damnedest, whatever he felt like doing. The students had already been enrolled and were well on their way to a college degree. Seeing his stooges graft was going to uh, backfire and redound unfavorably on him. He decided not to press the issue. My God, my God. Mm, 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 mm. Lord have mercy, Jesus. 
unbelievable, unbelievable the kind of graft and corruption that goes on around these places that we only know about now because Dr. Crosby took the time to go ahead and write down some of his experiences and share them with us. So thank goodness for that because he did all of this in his latter days before he had that last stroke that basically took him out, off the, um, out of the writing business. So I think, oh, I know, we're already over time. We're going to end our presentation right here today. But man, that was a good one. Apparently, I didn't get this far in his story previously because I certainly don't remember all that stuff. I do remember him talking about George Forbes and having to interact with George Forbes, but I don't remember him telling me any stories about George Forbes and these stooges. But I do recall talking to someone else in Cleveland and them relating to, to me this kind of patronage. That's what it's called. It's called patronage, where people get jobs because of their affiliation with different people, and they just get paid, but they don't do no work. They just take money right off the top. And this is why it's very difficult for these programs to actually bring about real progress in our communities because of stuff just like this. So reading this material is good not just to learn about Dr. Crosby's story, but to be able to recognize this kind of stuff when you see it coming down the pike. Because I guarantee you, if you have any kind of clout, any kind of oomph, any kind of ability to do anything or help anybody do anything, some of this stuff is going to come up. Either where they, they, they offer to hire you for a job at a higher wage that puts you in a nice corner office where you become like a cupid doll and don't do no work, but you're effectively disengaged from the process of doing anything real in the community, or then they come with some stuff like this. How can they skim some money off the top? Well, I'm glad nobody came to me with any proposals like that when I was working these kind of programs because it uh, wouldn't have gone very well. Definitely wouldn't have gone very well. They would that that was not going to get over. But neither here nor there. Meanwhile, we're going to go ahead and close out right here. This is Doc Ock at noon and nine, hoping that everybody out there is feeling real fine. Because this ain't just a line. This is real reality. We pray for everybody out there that y'all are all doing well, and we're sharing all these stories with you in the hopes that th these stories will be relevant to your life today, not just yesterday. Peace out, without a doubt, with plenty of justice, because anything less disgust us. And please don't forget to subscribe to the Tubular Black Facts channel. We need everybody out there to do that as well.